Right, so for today we are going to be looking at postmodernism and youth culture. That is the booklet that you should have, which was sent off last week, so you should have it at home. Uh, we're not going to start off straight away though by talking about um, postmodernism. Um, the first thing that you're going to do is a key rights test on the topics that we've done so far in youth culture, um, which is the social construction of youth, which remember you won't need as a specific question on the exam because um, they changed the syllabus, so it's not on the syllabus now, but it's still very important. And the writers, which you'll be answering the questions about in that key writers test, will be usable in youth culture and in stratification next year as well. You will be covering functionalism, which was the very first social theory that we looked at with youth culture, and you'll be covering Marxism, which was the one that we did last week. Um, out of the big four social theories that you'll look at in youth culture, Marxism, Functionalism, Postmodernism and Feminism, we're halfway through. There is Interactionism as well, but it doesn't take quite as big a um, role in youth culture as the others. Um, so we're halfway through the really, really important stuff. Remember, as I said, there is a, a method that you can use that means that any 35 mark combination of questions that they can ask you in the exam, remember you're asked two 35 markers, um, your chances are that you'll be able to answer those using the wide knowledge you will have of these four social theories in youth culture. So really important again that we know our, uh, our key writers when it comes to youth culture, especially those that write from the theoretical perspective. So the first thing that you're gonna be doing is your key writers test. You'll have seen that already, so if you haven't done it, you need to pause this now and do your key writers test. It shouldn't take too long, it's about 20 more questions. So pause the video and do your test. The next thing that you will be doing, so welcome back, hope it wasn't too bad. Uh, this will only be for groups who have looked and uh, watched This Is England Before Christmas. So you should have this handout here. And we filled in the front page of this handout when we looked at who, where, the, where This Is England was set, who Sean was, who Combo was, uh, and any information about how Combo was influencing Sean. But what we didn't do is we didn't link it to social theory being Marxism. So what I would like you to do, the groups that did watch This Is England, is I would like you to fill in this back page. So you've got questions like, what does Clark say about this particular group, the skinheads? Um, you've got a question on whether or not after watching the film you would disagree with Len Barton's criticism that was that this was a romantic, a romantic view of subcultures, that he made the skinheads Clark made the skinheads out to be better than they were by saying it was all about, you know, exaggerating their masculinity and fighting against capitalism in a conscious way. Maybe they were just racist, horrible people. I want your opinion on that. And here's the important part. Um, can you link the situation our skinheads are in to any other key writers that we looked at in Marxism? There is an easy part which I think you can link to Corrigan. There is an easy, well, or... There is certainly a part in there with certainly some behaviours of the skinheads which you can link to Hall and Jefferson's view and potentially the view of um, Paul Willis as well. So I'm thinking about using those writers here. Uh, and finally at the bottom, incorporation. Did you notice any examples of incorporation in the film? Or did you notice anything in the film now that's been incorporated from that skinhead group? There is, I think, probably one obvious one that has been taken. So once you've filled out both of those sides, and in particular, I'm thinking for the people who watched it, um, if you haven't watched it, obviously you don't have to do this. You will be doing this when we come to re for revision. But those who have watched it, that is a side that you need to fill out. And I need you to send me a picture of that side filled out, please. So that is your first task to do. You can send it me in Teams. Um, you could type it out or you could just simply scribble on there. Uh, if you haven't got a copy of the sheet, I will post it in the thread so that you know what the questions are that you need to be answering anyway. Okay, off you go. Right, so um, we are now going to start to focus on postmodernism, which is obviously the question. Uh, and as I said, we've got through a couple of the social theories already. Postmodernism is, once we've done this, we'll be 75% through the big four. Now, what I want you to do is start off by thinking about what you remember about the postmodern perspective. So we looked at it before when we did our introduction to um, social theory, but what I would like you to do is think about what springs to mind when you think about postmodernism. So 
any key writers you can remember. There's no absolute something. What would it say about things like gender? Uh, what is important in shaping your identity in the modern society? Any little things that you can remember about this postmodern perspective before we talk about it in more depth. So what have you got already in, the, in your tank that you're going to be building on today with your knowledge? Okay, so, um, hopefully, you've considered these things. Social construction is the first thing I always think of when I think about postmodernism. Remember, everything is a social construction, and by social construct, I mean that it is made by the society and the culture that we are in, like, built by society, a social construct. So things like gender is a social construct. Gender is separate from sex. It's something that we've made... Um, Almost the, 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 the boys and the girls are exactly the same when they come out. Uh, it's just the society and the culture around them that's going to affect their behaviour. The same with things like age, the same with things like ethnicity. So everything is a social construct. And when you get like, things that, that are a social construct, you get to pick and choose what you want to be in terms of your identity. So everything is a social construct. And when you get things that are a social construct, you have the pick and the choose, the kind of... Um, your own ability to decide your identity, who you want to be. Now, remember, there are no such thing as truths. Theories or science or religion are not true. And the reason that they're not true is because they can't fully explain the world that we live in. There are lots of different religions saying lots of different things. And within the same religions, and even within the same denominations within those religions, people are going to think slightly different things. So it's not an absolute truth. The same for things like science. Science can't explain um, why some people might want to identify as a different gender. Right? If we're saying that gender is a social construct, it doesn't give you the answers for that. And remember, science is theory, right? ready to prove itself wrong. So if you're around in the time of Newton when the apple drops on his head, you think that's what gravity is. But when we get a better explanation, then what we knew as gravity before kind of shifts. So is that really true? Postmodernists would say no. And remember, all of our social theories that we look at, Marxism, functionalism, feminism, they're all going to have weaknesses and problems with them, which shows that they can't be fully correct. Hopefully you're noticing a bit of a paradox here between the idea that no theory is true and the postmodern way of thinking. Well, maybe it isn't true because itself is a theory. Um, consumerism and the media, something that are very, very important. And they will be obviously massively important in picking and choosing your identity. Um, and then finally, neo-tribes. And we have looked at this idea of neo-tribes, and we will be looking at it in more depth today. So if you can't quite remember what a neo-tribe was, um, then that's fine. But I think the groups who will have studied um, ravers, for example, will be able to remember what we mean by a neo-tribe. Now, on the top of your page, what you've got are one, two, three, four different sets of keywords. One which is meta narrative, another which is consumerism, another which is fragmentation, and another which is neo tribes. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put these on the board um, and the PowerPoint will be attached. Can you fill out the meaning of the keywords here? And we'll discuss a couple of them in just a second as well because we probably need to talk a little bit more about meta narratives. Um, oh, and then fragmentation and neo-tribes, we'll get our definitions for in a second. So whilst you're putting down your idea of, or your definition for a uh, meta-narrative, remember, meta-narrative, we break it down to big story. And we've just talked about the big stories in life. Remember, the big stories like science and religion and theory, they all try to explain behaviour. But, according to our postmodernists, they all fail at doing so. We're going to look at the guy who very famously said that um, in just a second. So, our meta-narratives are our big stories that try to explain behaviour and what happens in society. And for our postmodernists, they are not going to do a very good job of doing that. Uh, of course, consumerism, buying stuff. Okay, so the, the, the fact that we live in a society whereby you are big consumers of material goods. You are the ones who are, are all who have a lot of spending power. And it says this is expanding, expanding following globalisation. We'll talk a little bit about globalisation in a second. Right, so, um, 
as we move on, and we'll, we'll do this in a, um, a second. So postmodernist, Bennett and Hedrington suggest, this is something that you really need to, to underline here. Class, ethnicity, gender are irrelevant in cultural terms for young people. So when we think about what I would say is a very, very important way of kind of stratifying groups, and breaking groups down, like cage. Postmodernists are going to say that cage is irrelevant nowadays for young people. So class, from a Marxist perspective, is irrelevant. Gender, from a feminist perspective, is irrelevant. It's not something that matters for young people anymore. It's not something that is a, di a distinguishing factor, and therefore it doesn't matter in today's society. Youth as a social construct lasts longer, and people can pick and choose their friendships and social groups based around their needs at the time. It is not that they stay in friendship groups of the same sex or the same gender, uh, the same class, the same ethnicity. So, uh, it says, postmodernists reject the traditional ways of explaining society. This means that they reject meta-narratives. Those are you missing words there such as Marxism and functionalism. So here is our, um, our next question. Comparison to Marxism, and I'm gonna ask you to do this in just a second, but what do Marxists believe, using this picture as an uh, inspiration? Nothing like a Big Mac and Coke after a hard day, resisting, rebelling, protesting against capitalism. So there's a little image to remind you about what, um, you know, what our Marxists think. I'll just move the camera around there. Um, so compared to Marxism, what is a Marxist going to think about society? What is a Marxist going to say compared to the ideas that we've just had for postmodernism? Pause it there, have a think, start to fill out that box. We'll come back and we'll discuss it in a second. Okay, so remember, if you're a Marxist, you're going to say that class is super important. Class is the most important factor. And we want really, we want, remember, we want rid of capitalism. We want to get rid of capitalism. Now, for postmodernists, right, postmodernists are talking about consumerism. And when we say consumerism, we really mean being in a capitalist world because capitalism, private business ownership, allows you to sell products and capitalism is all about buying and all about selling. So for our Marxist class is the most important factor. They want to get rid of capitalism and youth cultures form to resist against this. And remember, all of our youth cultures that you'll get for Marxism are working class, usually male, usually white as well, but there's another point. So this, this is what our Marxists think. And what you're going to get is postmodernists criticising that. They're going to be very critical of Marxism. And in fact, Sarah Thornton, who we're going to look at later on today, there she is. Um, you can tell postmodernism is the new social theory because... She's not only a lady, but she's in a colour photograph, which, uh, which is good for sociology. Um, Sarah Thorne's going to say this. Class is irrelevant because most youth cultures are media generated. And Marxism is going to ignore this very important facet, this very important aspect of youth culture. That's going into your missing section here just before we get to leotard. So that goes in that top um, bullet point there. And now we're gonna get a bit technical. Because now we need to hear from this fella, oh, this fella leotard. And what leotard's gonna say links in nicely to these questions. So if you're in class, um, and it might be nice if you want to post your uh, ideas to this in the thread that we've got for the group. It might be quite useful. Um, 
First question is, is society fair? So think in your head, do you think society is fair? Number two, does it bother you whether you say perhaps that society is unfair? You know, look at these images on the left hand side. Does it bother you that that's the case? Then my question is, what do you do about it? Society, yeah, you, you might have said most of you that society is society's not fair. And it might bother you that it's not fair, because when you see these, you feel bad. But what do you do about it? And do you make it worse? So those of you who might have said, yes, it bothers me. Um, what do I do about it? I'll give a little bit of money to charity. Um, I, I, you know, I, I volunteer once a week. Well, I could very, I mean, I don't give any money to charity. Um, you know, I, I'm, I know society is unfair. Does it bother me? Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't really want to see this. I don't want to see destitution and poverty. But what do I do about it? Well, I don't really do a lot about it. And do I make it worse? Yeah, definitely. Of course I make it worse because I'm filming this on my iPhone, which I like. And then I'm going to drive home in my car, which I like. And I'm going to wear, well, I wear the same thing for work every day, don't I? But I mean, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be able to purchase the clothes and the technology that I want. And all the money that I get from work, I'm going to save to try and buy a new house or a bigger car or a newer phone or a brand new laptop or a new PC or some other new technology. Some fancy suits, a nice watch. Now, am I making it worse? Yeah, potentially. Because what I'm doing is I'm ignoring this side and I'm wasting my money on Yeezys when what I should be doing, in theory, is giving all the excess money that I own, perhaps to somebody who needs it more. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad about this, right? I've told you my, um, the situation that I'm in. So if you're in a very similar situation, then you shouldn't feel bad about it. There's, you know, uh, there's quite a few, um, there's a guy, he's an Oxford professor, he's called Will McCaskill. Um, interestingly, he wrote, he wrote a book called Effective Altruism. And he's part of a movement whereby um, these people who want to give back to society because they think it's unfair contribute, I think it's roughly 70% of the money that they, the extra money that they make straight into charities. So he works out what the baseline is for him to live for his mortgage or his rent or to run his car, um, to buy whatever he needs, you know, his shopping, and then every other bit of excess goes straight to a charity. And I think he works out, if you give effectively, I think £14,000, he said, and that seems very high, if you give it to the correct organisation, saves a life, or you, you know what I mean, creates a very fair, nice life for a person, pulls somebody out of, out of a destitute situation. So he's doing that, I mean, he's giving like 70% of his income. He obviously really cares. But, you know. So, our situation is linked to this. This is the idea at the bottom of page number one. It says, for Leotard, meta-narratives such as Marxism, remember, because it's a big meta-narrative, it's a theory, have failed. They are in decline because of, and this is the thing I want you to analyse here, the victory of capitalism over the predictions of Marxism. Individual pursuit of goods and services have replaced idealism. Rather than rebelling against capitalism, young people have embraced consumer culture. So this is how Leotard would be critical of the Marxist view. And what you are going to do is you are going to write me a paragraph here. I mean, you've got some lines to explain it, so I'd like you to use the lines to explain it in brief. But I'd like a little paragraph. can't be any more than 200, 250 words. That would be the maximum. Explaining what that quote means. And you've got to go into some detail. So what does Leotard mean when he says the victory of capitalism over the predictions of Marxism? In order to answer that, you need to go back and you need to remind yourself what Marx did and what he predicted. And perhaps how that prediction hasn't come about. What do we mean by the individual pursuit of goods and services 
which has replaced idealism. What was Marx's ideal? When you go back to this picture, what would Marx want you to do if you see inequality and unfairness to people who are in the same group as you? What does Marx think that you should be doing with your money? Is it like you might be now, spending it all on watches, or is it a bit more like Will McCaskill's doing in giving all of it away? And rather than rebelling against capitalism, which remember is the reason that according to our Marxists that youth cultures and subcultures, the spectacular ones, exist, people have embraced consumer culture. What do we mean by that? And how do you know that people have embraced consumer culture? So pause it now. I want you to write this out, type this out. You can, you can make, make sure you've got the, bit, bo the bottom bit filled in. But I want a paragraph, 200, 250 words explaining what Leotard means when he says this. You can post it to me in Teams, you can write it on a piece of paper and send me a picture, you can email it me if you want, whatever medium it comes through, it doesn't matter, as long as I want it to check. Go. Okay, so let's look at postmodernism so far then. We've looked at uh, our comparison there to Marxism. We know youth is a social construct, it's all about picking and choosing how you want to be, your identity. We know that they're going to be critical of Marxists because they're going to think that class is irrelevant. It's the same as gender and ethnicity. Um, and that it's all about the impact of the media. We live in a consumer culture where it's all about buying and selling. Um, and, I mean, we'll, we'll look at this in a, in a second. So the postmodern view on youth as we turn to page number two now. So we should be on page number two. Is that youth culture has become increasingly fragmented. Okay, and fragmentation is one of your keywords on the front page, but there's room for a definition here. Now, fragmentation means broken up, and the connections have been pulled apart. So think about, I said, has it changed since the 1900s? So we'll go 1900s, oh, for God's sake, crikey, to 2020. Language. What language are we all speak in? English. Um, what religion are we all? Christian. Um, music, probably just going to be straightforward, you know, British kind of music. Um, we've got, um, if you think about education, we've got segregation. Because if I'm teaching you all now in the 1900s, you're either all middle class or upper class, or you're all working class. Think about gender. We have defined gender roles for men and women. Um, income. The working class get paid poorly. The middle class and the upper class get lots of dollar. That's what's happening in the 1900s. So if you think now about language, it could be any language you want because we live in a fragmented society where things and the normal connections that we have are broken up. So you can speak, some of you might be bilingual. I'm just a monoglot myself, but there we go. Christian, that part of our culture has changed. Increased secularism, or the fact that we've got additional cultures and cultural diversity, meaning that there's a multitude of different religions here that you can believe. Education, segregation, that's changed as well, hasn't it? Okay, because now you can sit in class with somebody who might be the son or daughter of two doctors and you could be a very working class person and you look exactly the same, there's no difference, you're both sat in the same educational institution, learning the same stuff, being taught by teachers with the same qualifications. Um, you can't tell what the class is of somebody by looking at them. Very rare to be able to do that nowadays. Um, if you think about gender, Gender roles are divided. The traditional gender role of woman as the homemaker and man as the uh, breadwinner have gone. And in fact, we live in a society where gender um, has shifted to the point where it might be a social construct and people can pick and choose their gender. So certainly we see a lot of fragmentation here when we think about gender. And then think about income. Before, if you were a working class person, you'd be on a low income. But what about if you're a plumber now or an electrician? You've got a lot of income that potentially you could get hold of, which might mean you're earning more than, than me, a teacher with a middle class job. 
So the, the way the incomes, um, your wealth, well, I say your wealth, I'll say your income, your income might have changed, that might have fragmented, okay? And obviously the key is they are all based on consumerism. So consumerism again, the dominance of material goods and buying stuff. In the 1900s, we did not live in a consumer, or in the 1910s, 1920s, we didn't live in a consumer-driven world. In fact, you, get, you have to wait until the teddy boys come about in the 50s to see a proper consumer subculture, or proper consumer culture where it was aimed at the kids, and they had to wear these clothes, and they were expensive, and that was what they were there to do. So, we need to understand what consumerism is, and I think that we do from that, but we need to understand what fragmentation is. Because fragmentation is very important to postmodernism. So, remember, we've got, still on page two now, people can buy into styles and clothing. Whereas early youth cultures were subcultures with clear social rules and a clear structure, Things are changing for our postmodernists, and they are very critical of the CCCS, the Centre for Contemporary Cultural Study, our Marxist writers that we looked at last week, because they're going to say that we no longer have these subcultures just made up of working class lads that exist knocking about. And to some extent, well, I think they could be right. So because they're saying class, gender, ethnicity are no longer important, we can get rid of spectacular subcultures that used to exist in society. Those are gone. It's finished. The Marxists are wrong. There is no such thing as these spectacular subcultures. And if you remember, we've got Marxists, we've got functionalists, and we've got postmodernists here. This is the thing to be able to draw out. This is youth culture, and this is why they would say that things that youth cultures fall. So when we look at Marxists, what do they look at? They look at spectacular subcultures. And they're all going to be working class. Why do they form? Resistance to capitalism. When we look at functionalists, they look at youth culture as a whole. And the reason that forms is a rite of passage. That's the reason that youth culture exists. When it's postmodernism, we go now to neo tribes, which we'll mention in a second. And the reason that they form is all about identity, to pick and choose, because your identity is nothing but a social construct. And the traditional lines that meant you would join a working class subculture are gone. They're fragmented. It's finished. So you've got two writers underneath that would be supporting this idea. Hedrington argues that fashion and music styles in the 80s have been too bitty and have varied to be described as subcultures. It's too fragmented. We're living in a society where there is too much fragmentation to put people into these traditional brackets of you're in a working class subculture who listens to this music, you're in a middle class subculture who listens to this music. It's too varied. Music and style has changed. You don't have a specific working class style. You don't have a specific middle class style. It's whatever you want it to be. And Willis would support this. He would say there are now a range of styles, tastes and cultures, and young people have lots of different ways to show their identity. Um, there's no single type of youth culture or youth subculture. And young people don't want to conform to just having one individualistic taste. It's like you don't want the label anymore. You don't want to be given the label of, you are a punk. We live in a society where people don't want to be identified by that, in some senses. So, um, we've, got, we've got rid of these, okay? Um, Hethington and Willis, we're getting rid of these traditional subcultures. We don't have them anymore. And obviously, they've got to be replaced by something else. Here's an example of our postmodern dresses. Right, that's a very postmodern look. He's got their tight back jeans on, maybe that's a bit goth or a bit emo. Um, he's got the maybe, I don't know, chubby trainers on. He's got um, this kind of tart and top on, which would be something that was grunge. He's got a weird, like, granny style, like, fluorescent jumper. I don't know where you would class that at. Maybe it's a bit rave. 
He's got big old thick glasses on and he's got long hair like he's a rocker. What, what, what subculture does he belong to? Well, he doesn't. Why is he wearing that? Oh, he thinks it looks all right. He is a, he's a good example. If you know, um, these, both these pictures will link to songs by these two bands. Um, but they are the same band. I think the Kings of Leon are a prime example of a postmodern band. You might have heard of the Kings of Leon. That was Kings of Leon like 20 years ago when I was young. They came up with an album called Youth and Young Manhood, which is a garage rock album. Brilliant, but it sounds nothing like the, uh, the now postmodern look that they've got now. Their musical genre has changed. You know, Sex is on Fire and other songs like that are nothing like they were playing back when they just started out. So they're a good example of a postmodern band. So instead of looking for subcultures, we need to look for neo-tribes. And we'll talk a little bit more about what a neo-tribe is in just a second. But I've got a couple of quite funny videos here to show you because now we're going to look at the Manchester Institute of Popular Culture. Last, last time you were looking at the CCCS and they're from Birmingham, so that's near my way. Now we look at the Manchester Institute of Popular Culture and they investigate ravers, clubbers in the 90s. Um, now, uh, our clubbers in the 90s, uh, as you see on the bottom of page number two, um, are going to come, according to Sarah Thornton, from anywhere in the geography of the area. Okay, It doesn't matter if they are working class, it doesn't matter if they're middle class, it doesn't matter if they're black or they're white, it doesn't matter if they're male or they're female, you are fine to go raving. You are fine to go out and be part of that group for the night. And what she's gonna say is they're gonna to come together just for that event. They are not there to make maybe long lasting relationships. They're not a close knit group. They're just turning up for that one experience, that one rave. So again, for the Manchester Institute of Popular Culture, ravers are a good example of showing that class, age, gender, ethnicity are no longer relevant for the youth of today. You could come from any background. You could be as old as him or as young as me. Turn yourselves onto page number three. Because on page number three, we've got our final um, three key writers to go through. And remember, it is ramping up now, so there are a lot more key writers than there would be, um, than there would be normally. Um, on page number three, you've got Mafasoli. Now, Mafasoli, I'm only going to briefly talk about Mafasoli, because Mafasoli is the guy who kind of kicks this all off. Now, Mafasoli um, is going to come up with this idea of tribalisation. And we see Neo-Tribe developing from his idea. He's an older kind of French postmodern thinker. And what he's going to say is, today it's all about identity politics. And fragmentation has, has led to a mass, a mass culture breaking down. So no longer do we want to be defined by just maybe our, our, our obvious background. Um, we want to be put into a smaller group based on the shared ideals we have with another person. So you might be, have a really, really strong set of political ideals. And that means that you want to hang about with people who are the same for that particular day. But you also want to hang about with somebody else and you can switch your, your philosophy another day. Um, people no longer identify with one single youth culture, but belong to a number and switch between it. So you might sit there and go, oh yeah, well I really like, um, you know, I, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think here. I really love the, uh, this is hard now. I really like clubbing, right? So I'm gonna be a clubber on one night, but I don't wanna hang about with clubbers because my other interest is gonna be uh, literature. And I like this particular type of literature. So my book club that I'm gonna go to on another night wouldn't have people who share and overlap. They may be not clubbers at all, but I can be a clubber on that night and I can be something else on another day. I can switch between. And that is what we mean by tribalization. That's Mafasoli who starts this idea and it leads to Bennett creating the idea of neo-tribes. So subcultures are no longer existing. 
but neo-tribes exist. And this is a loose group of people with similar tastes and consumer choices. So if you imagine, when he says a loose group, he means no cage. There's no link between class, age, gender, and ethnicity. That's what he means by a loose group. Ravers could come from anywhere. But they've got similar consumer choices. So those consumer choices could be drugs, could be dance music, could be glow sticks, um, could be neon paint, could be acid house logo, could be colourful clothes. Now these are the consumer choices of a raven. Anybody can join the group and they're all going to be consuming the same things. Right? They can be consuming drugs. It's fine, it isn't, even if they're illegal, it doesn't mean they can't be consumers of it. However, just like I said, I'm going to a rave and I like all of these things on Saturday night, but come Tuesday afternoon, I'm going to my book club, where that is not going to be something that takes place. And I don't have to wear those clothes or dress that way or take part in those behaviours. I can do something else. Um, argues that subcultures today are pluralistic, diverse, and shifting. So if you do want to, and that's why he describes them as neo tribes, if you do want to say, well, Ravers is a subculture, well, it's not because traditional subcultures share the same norms and values all the time. These are shifting, they're pluralistic, there's loads of them. You could be a raver, a literature fan, a cosplay person, um, a paintballer, that could be a neo tribe. So, for example, in nightclubs there are different side symbols and attitudes and beliefs that go on in it that don't happen outside. And in a nightclub you all come together from a different background, you're all doing the same thing, and outside of the nightclub everybody has their own shared life their own individual life rather than a, a shared understanding of everybody there because they're all different. So, um, cosplay is an example of a neo -troy. Um There should be a video attached on those that you can watch that shows some other examples. And, um, oh, here's, here's something else. Right, so we move on from your next one. So make sure that you've got down, Benny, you filled out your box so you know what he's talking about. And then we move on to uh, look at our next person, who I exemplify by this. And these are obviously tattoos. Now these tattoos are like Maori design tattoos. And where does that come from? New Zealand. But that's Mike Tyson. And he's not from New Zealand, so what's he doing with a traditional Maori tattoo? What is your uncle doing with a full Maori sleeve when he's never left the UK, if he's anything like mine? Um, never been outside Europe, but has got a full Maori tattoo on his arm. Why is that the case? Why is he picking something that's got a lot of meaning to another group, but he is just deciding that, hey, that's what I want on my arm? And the reason is because nowadays what exists is a supermarket of style, according to a guy called Ted Polymus. Now what Polymus is gonna say, that today is all about choosing and creating your own identity in a pick and mix world where you can be whatever you wanna be. And postmodernists say that style is the most important feature to you. So you can sit there with your Doc Martens on, but you don't need to be a skinhead. You can sit there with a safety pin stuck through your bag or through your clothes and you don't have to be a punk. You can sit there with a Burberry hat on and you don't have to be a chav. And you can be wearing all three of those things now at once and it doesn't mean anything to you. Um, style is a more important feature of youth than opposing capitalism, than the Marxist said. Style is not used to resist like Hall and Jefferson told us, or like we have with bricolage, but actually it's about your identity. So you can dress like a punk, you can wear a Rolling Stones t-shirt if you want, and you can never have listened to a song of the Rolling Stones. 
If I said to you, Angie, you'd say, where does she live? Now, um, you can change your style rapidly, and this supermarket of style is heavily impacted by globalization, the world getting smaller. And an example is these Maori tattoos, because you can't have those if you don't know what's going on in New Zealand. You need to be aware of the style in New Zealand to have them, but they don't mean anything to you. You just think that they're cool. And that's what Polymer says, this going shopping in the um, supermarket of style. This is what society is turned into. This is what life is. Okay. On the bottom of page number three, because we are literally almost done, um, it says, postmodern ideas say that youth subcultures are no longer, missing word, relevant in today's society. They suggest that youth styles have become increasingly broken up and divided, which means it's fragmented and diverse. Youth styles are now more diverse, changing, flowing, uh, and are no longer based on class lines, gender, or ethnicity. So personally say, youth subcultures are no longer relevant, youth styles have become fragmented, youth styles are now more diverse, and are no longer based on class lines, gender, and ethnicity. You can pick and choose your identity. So one day, you can be goth kid, the next day, you can be um, new wave, I think that's probably emo, you can be one day, then you can be goth kid, then you can be an Edwardian gentleman, then you can be the king of the mods, then you can be a punk, then you can be a space cowboy, and finally you can be a glitter ball. And if none of you have seen the Mighty Boosh before, that's Vince Noir. The video is quite fun. It's a prime example of what is a postmodern person. Vince Noir. He dresses like he wants, he mixes his style every day, and he has no meaning to it. He just thinks it looks stylish and it looks cool. So, on page number four, what you should have is some evaluation points for postmodernism. So, I'm going to give you the prompts here, and hopefully, as you look at the prompts, you can think of what the actual weaknesses are. First one, do any subcultures still exist? Think about the work of Hodkinson, who we looked at in the very first lesson, that is a prominent subculture that you might say still exists today. And actually, when you're in that subculture, you're in it kind of for a very, very long time. It breaks the usual boundaries of the subculture. It's a middle class one, as you can. Does wealth make a difference to style? And if so, how? Because we're talking here about postmodernism being all about style, but surely your income and your wealth is going to make a difference to the style choices you can make. Uh, what exists, which a Marxist would say is still the biggest issue in society, I'm hoping you remember that it's Marxist, so they're only going to think one thing makes a difference. What is it? So, pause it now and think about those prompts. And we're going to come back to look at the actual weaknesses. So weakness number one. I hope you remember Paul Hodkinson. Hodkinson looks at the Goths, they're a middle class subculture, and Goth still exists today. It's reasonably prominent, and what Hodkinson says is when you Goth, you Goth for life. Okay? You're a Goth when you're young, and you manage to keep that Gothic um, subcultural roots embedded within you as you go into later life. So, actually, this idea of neo tribes doesn't work for the Goths and therefore doesn't work at all. Hodkinson would say, because he knows that there's a subculture that does still exist, that does dress the same way, listen to the same music, have the same norms and values. Next one, and this is Harry Bradley's criticism, postmodernism ignores the structural differences in life, such as wealth. Wealth is going to have a big impact on your style choices. What if all of a sudden I want to be, um, and I want to style my identity around Conor McGregor, wearing a crazy amount of suits, and shed loads of really expensive watches. What's the problem if I'm on the dole and I've got no money? Well, I can't have that lifestyle choice. I can't choose that if I don't have the wealth to do it. So actually, this idea that, oh, well, it doesn't matter what class you're from, your class closely links to your wealth, and certainly wealth's gonna make a big difference, and it's supported by our Marxists. If a point number three would say, does not address very real issues of inequality that we face in society, such as social class. In fact, it doesn't address a lot of the issues because it's going to say, well, 
plus gender and ethnicity don't really matter anymore, do they? So why address the issues that take place there when they're not even relevant areas? And your final one, number four, this is something that you wouldn't be able to recognise as a criticism. It's hard to give you a point for this, but this is a very famous uh, American academic called Noam Chomsky. He's going to say that postmodernism is just a buzzword. It's just a word that the thinkers who are postmodernists say, and there cannot be any basis for their research. Postmodernism is, 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 a, is a way of thinking as much as it is a social theory. So how would you be able to measure people's identity in a, in a neo-tribe? How would you be able to ad address and how would you be able to measure the meaning which they have to items? It's very, very difficult. So therefore, it just becomes a buzzword for postmodern thinkers. Um, and it can't be used for any real research. It's just all purely theoretical. There are a couple of strengths of postmodernism, isn't there? And the first one is this. Sure, great name. I'm going to argue that you are less political now as young people. And if you're sitting there going, I don't know my political right wing from my political left wing, then he's right. If you don't care about politics, if you don't care about capitalism, if you're quite happy with being able to buy your trainers and your iPhone or whatever else it's got, then you are agreeing with Shaw's point, which is that actually you don't join spectacular subcultures. You're not going to revolt against the government anymore. Postmodernism is correct. You've given up thinking about that. All you care about is yourself. And I don't mean to say that horribly because that's, that's just the way it is. And here's another one, and you will have heard this, and you might have even said this. I don't want to be labelled. Don't give me a label anymore. Well, that's what postmodernists are saying. They're saying that people don't want labels. They want to be able to move and shift and be pluralistic, and they want to be diverse in their style and the groups that they hang about with and the friends that they have. So no longer do they want the label of you're in a working class subculture, you're a teddy boy. They don't want that. So thus they can develop these loose affiliations with groups and neo-tribe groups. Okay. Right, to finish, um, rather than setting you a, a forms quiz, because I've already got a mark one of those, your final task is this. Uh, and then when it's done, I want you to send me a picture of it. On page number six, I believe, I'll just double check that your uh, handout is the same as mine. Yep. On page number six, what you've got is this box. It says an overview of postmodernism, uh, the postmodern view of youth cultures. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six boxes there. All I would like you to do is consolidate what each of these thinkers or each of these concepts means and pop it into your book. When it's done, you're going to send me a picture of it to show that it is complete. So it's going to mean that some of you today will have done the key writers quiz, will have sent me a picture of your um, Marxism book uh, handout complete. Um, you will have sent me a brief paragraph on postmodernism versus Marxism, and now you're going to send me this to show you that it's done. Okay? So four things to do, but of course, if you didn't have the um, privilege of watching This Is England, which don't worry, you will do before the end of the year. Um, obviously, you've got to be in class to do that. So that's fingers crossed. Um, you only got to do the three things um, that I've mentioned. You can forget about the This Is England for now. Okay. Um, after we've done this, we've got one more to look at, which is feminism. And then we can put together a 40 marker. We're at that particular point. All right. So thanks, guys. Uh, any questions, as always, I'll be online. Um, I will see you. Uh, I'll see you later.